Okay. Good afternoon and good evening. I'm Alon Confino. I'm the director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Me Memory Studies at UMass Amherst. And I'm delighted to welcome you to one more event of Encounters, which is a conversation on important books on the Holocaust, genocide, and uh, mass violent events organized by the Institute at Amherst, as well as the Avraham Harman Research Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I'd like to thank my colleague and friend Amos Goldberg, who is the director of that institute. Today, we are going to have a conversation on, on Anna Haikova's new book, The Last Ghetto, an everyday histo history of Theresienstadt, which was published last year by Oxford University Press. Before we start, some housekeeping things. I'd like to remind you that all our events are recorded and later, later posted to our YouTube channel and website. And we encourage you to go visit and share them. Uh, please write your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, not at the chat. The chat and the list of participants will be live for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, and then will be switched off. I'd also like to remind you of our next event of Encounters, which will take place on April 20th. At the same time, it's going to be a conversation on Unworthy Republic, the dispossession of Native Americans and the road to Indian territory by Claudio Sont. Claudio Sont is the Richard Russell Professor in American History and Distinguished Research Professor at the University of Georgia. And he will discuss it with Barbara Krauthammer, Dean, College of Humanities and Fine Arts and Professor of History at UMass Amherst. And now it's my great pleasure and honor to have with us Dr. Anna Haikova, Associate Professor of Modern European Continental History at the University of Warwick. She regularly contributes to mass media in English, German, and Czech in publications such as Haaretz, Sudeutsche Zeitung, Tablet, and the Tagesspiegel. She holds a PhD from the University of Toronto. Her dissertation, on which the last ghetto is based, was, a, was awarded both the Herbert Steiner as well as the Irma Rosenberg Prizes in 2014. Amos Goldberg is the Jonah Machover Chair in Holocaust Studies at the Department of Jewish History and Contemporary Jewry and the head of the Research Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. His book on critical thoughts on Holocaust historiography and remembrance is forthcoming shortly in Hebrew by wrestling publications in a few months. Goldberg was 2018-2019 J.B. and Maurice C. Shapiro, Senior Scholar in Residence in the Mandel Center at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Anna and Amos, it's a great pleasure to have here both of you. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, so you're muted again. Thank you, Alon, for this uh, introduction, and uh, thank you very much uh, for this whole enterprise of the uh, Encounters project. And thank you, Anna, for uh, joining us. So let's uh, go. Let's start. I mean, you have you've written an incredible book. I enjoyed. I mean, if you say enjoy, but a very, I would say, um, uh, unsettling book about uh, Theresienstadt ghetto, very different from the books we know about Holocaust ghetto. So let me start with really the, the first question about, about this. Uh, you wrote a book about Theresienstadt. Now, already we've discussed it several times, this quote. In 1947, 
one of the ghetto survivors, uh, Emil Utitz, wrote in an introduction to his own book, 1947, on, on, on Theresienstadt, that so much has been written, nonetheless, he has something new to say. So since then, that was 1947, now we are 2021, libraries were written on, uh, on Theresienstadt. So what is there still new to say? Um, what new could be said on Theresienstadt? Or in other words, quoting your own subtitle, which is like all other, every word in this is very loaded. Why do you consider, as you write, Theresienstadt a well-known but poorly understood ghetto? Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just see. Yes, I'm speaking. So first of all, I'm thrilled and honored, but also a little bit humbled to be in Encounters. You were the first ones to invite me, and it's, uh, I guess, my most important invitation because also Amos, your work was really important for me. I was finishing up uh, this uh, dissertation. So thank you so much for having me. It is hard to have a book come out during the pandemic, but the silver lining is the opportunity to exchange with people around the world, albeit on Zoom. So I am really enjoying it. Amos, the subtitle that you mentioned is the subtitle of the, or the title of the introduction. And Yes, you get the question a lot. Um, so much has been written on it already. Why your book? And I do wonder if that question is asked to men as often as it is asked of women. Um, you know, as I know, because this is something that illuminates both of our work, is how much of the Holocaust has been written in a way of memory rather than of history. Something to give credence to the imagined state of Israel, but also to other states. And also it was a research that was deeply driven by the survivors and to the lessons that they took coming out of the Holocaust. So, for example, one of the most important uh, books about Theresienstadt and the very beautiful influential book is Ruth Bondi's uh, biography of Jakob Edelstein, the first elder of the Jews. And Bondi was a Zionist during the war. She was a Zionist after the war. In fact, she was a journalist for one of the big Israeli newspapers, not for Haaretz. And it really is the illuminating spirit of the book. And when I came to Theresienstadt, I was driven by two things. One was I wanted to write a modern history of Theresienstadt that will try to get away from these various expectations and look at it as a case study and study Theresienstadt per se to go beyond the established famous narratives and to look at all possible testimonies that are there the early and the late, those written by young people, those written by elderly, those written by uh, middle-aged people, not only the children and not only the children's drawings, bring them all together and to ask what it means, to kind of go beyond the canon and look at the many layers of what it meant to be in Theresienstadt, not to have one truth, but I guess to quote from our conversation of the last few days, couple of truths and to put them together as a palimpsest. The other thing that I um, endeavored to do is to use Theresienstadt as a case study of society in extremis. You are muted again. What, 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 what do you actually mean society in, in extreme? Yeah, so um, some secret people are really fascinated by when they look at the Holocaust um, is um, these are people who are going to be murdered. And eventually some of them realize that they're going to be murdered. They are experiencing starvation, constant fear, crowded accommodation, dirt, diseases, um, violence, even though the violence, the way how it plays out depends from concentration camp to concentration camp, from ghetto to ghetto. And that's one of the things that I uh, addressed in my book. And this does something to a society. It's a, extreme society and one of the things that I argued is when we look closely at the societal processes that go on in Theresienstadt, they continue. The social continues until the very end. The things that define, I guess, what is human or what is the social, decision with whom to go on transport, with whom are you trying to uh, share accommodation. If you can share to share one meal a day with someone is it going to be your lover or is it going to be your family? Is it going to be your brother? Is it going to be your comrades from your political group? And these are, I think, very profound moments of the social. I guess looking at it from the outside, we may uh, uh, neglect them as something matter of fact. And I guess this is the task of the history of everyday life to recognize the political in these seemingly 
small everyday gestures. And this is the vault that I tried to uh, put together. So you, you, let's go a little bit deeper into this. Uh, you, you, your study, uh, you, you, take it, you take this object of study of research the Theresienstadt society mm -hmm. from various angles, but one of the most, I think, profound and not, not very rarely done like that mm -hmm is that you take the social, social history perspective you, and you take it very seriously as if it's a, you would done it to every other society to, to look at, and, and, and you mention it, and a, a cornerstone of your analysis is the concept of class, uh, which usually don't use so, uh, so often in, 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 in Holocaust historiography. So what do we gain from going this way? And what do we actually find? What did you actually find when you talk about class? What mm -hmm. kind of class? How do they? How are they constructed? What mm -hmm. kind of uh, conflicts between classes? Cla the, the various classes you have. Mm -hmm. what, what were the different strata in the ghetto, and how were they constructed? How they played mm -hmm. out? Mm -hmm. So, can you say elaborate a bit or more than a bit about this concept of class in the ghetto? Mm -hmm. Amos, it would be a pleasure. First on social history. Um, I think, yes, the book is social history, but it is also cultural history. And it's a history, it's an Alltagsgeschichte, this very classical German 1980s um, historical anthropology, where I look at the various things that people did back in the day. And I read it as if I were an uh, anthropologist only. I do not sit in a village observing people, but I sit in the archive looking at the testimonies, observing them as if I were anthropologists and always ask, what does it mean? I need to get out of our modern eyes and saying, this is what it means, but try to recognize the frameworks of meaning that it had back then. We still say stigmatized sex work or sexual barter, but how it was stigmatized and how the stigma came about was different in the 1940s and it's our task to uh, get it together. So I just want to methodologically make uh, that point. I would love to bear the recognition that I'm one of the very few people to work on class, but I'm not. Many people like uh, the late Avi Barkai or Dalia Offa, who is very alive and active, have worked on that uh, uh, before. Um, I may have a different interpretation than others, but their work has been very inspirational to me. I think the cornerstone for my understanding of class was not to operate on economical basis alone, but to also, and in that I was influenced by um, um, French sociology like Pierre Bourdieu, to look at things like um, taste or social capital and cultural capital and other forms, and to look how people are sent to the ghetto. It's incredibly important who arrives first, and it's two groups of Prague of young Czech men and how these people are endowed with incredible prestige. And as people come in, they basically shake off their old class. In almost all instances, it is almost irrelevant. And a new social system emerges. And I would not argue that my book will be applicable one-to-one. -one. I think if somebody will think that they will kind of miss the point. But one of the things that I would argue is that what I uh, hope I have succeeded is the methodological how to reconstruct the social world and this social hierarchy that emerges here. In a way, in Theresienstadt, that um, altogether some 144,000 people pass through the ghetto at its biggest, it had 60,000 inhabitants uh, in uh, fall 1942. And people never had, I guess, more than five or six uh, degrees of separation, but they lived in their own bubbles. And if you were a young Czech butcher who, you know, had access to their own accommodation, to the so-called cubbyhole, so kumbal. You could play soccer, you could date pretty young women at more than one, and you could be relatively protected from transports until 444 when it's the Germans rather than the Jewish self-administration that put together the transports. You lived in a relatively prestigious position. Yes, you could still be bugged by the bed bugs. Yes, some of your friends would be put on transport. And yes, you are in the ghetto, you cannot go to the cinema, you cannot go to swing dances, but you live in the ghetto and therefore your life is beautiful because people get used to the ghetto surprisingly quickly. And what is worthwhile contrasting, say, with the life of our butcher who, you know, may not even be circumcised and has the vaguest of ideas of uh, what is put him. And in fact, there are a couple of very charming, but also, I guess, for Jewish studies, 
surprising conversations that I was able to unearth from the Resin Chat, how the Chilchus are debating what is Purim, and they are really completely lost. They do not know what is the difference between Yom Kippur uh, to Passover and whatnot, and rather than saying they were bad Jews, it's a very interesting statement what to take from today's Inchat towards Jewish history. So to contrast our butcher, we say a uh, Viennese elderly who are 80 or 85 years old, who arrived to today's Inchat expecting a spa. And they find out it's a ghetto, but not only it's a dirty ghetto, they are accommodated in some of the worst parts, they are brought to the attics where there is uh, no running water, there's no electricity, there are not yet windows, and the overwhelming majority of them dies there in their own excrement. The reason why they are brought in this bad accommodation, it is because at this point, the Rezin Shad is filling up and the Jewish self-administration, our Jakob Edelstein, whom I just mentioned from uh, Ruth Bondi, even though she does not address this uh, topic, decided this is still the part of the ghetto that is free. And this is why they sent the elderly there. And this is one of the reasons why the mortality is so high. And rather than kind of contrasting these two cases with kind of the top and the bottom, it's one of the many layers that are there. And at the same time, some of the elderly are able through a lot of social stamina and through social capital and uh, through um, also great desire and agency to make it out, to be reconnected with their children, or to simply the will to live, to make a career. And you have older German-speaking Jews from Vienna and Berlin who learn Czech, who actually learn relatively decent Czech. And many of these moving moments when you look at their diaries, and it's often the diaries that are particularly useful means to reconnect to their world, how the Czech creeps into the entries, how they no longer say uh, shelf, or oh, um, um, regal, they will start saying polička, but when they write polička, they will spell it in the German way, but I know that, nobody else knows. And those are some of the things that I try to get across as this um, multi-layeredness of these social classes that stay firm, but people can do something about them up to a point. And when you look at those elderly who make it to the end, it's never an accident. So what 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 are the criteria or what are the it's ethnic, it's national, it's um, your profession. What are the criteria that shapes this very stratified society? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Amos, I don't know if you know it. You look very frustrated and very impatient. Please look a little bit more friendly. You are scaring me. Yes, thank you. Really um, it's a I'm bunch of things. It's a bunch of things. Um, ethnicity is really important, age is immensely important, gender, social capital, and then seniority. And seniority is interesting here because um, as I was thinking about how to conceptualize all of the material, I realized something that is quite useful is the history of prisons. And of course, we know from history of prisons, one of the really important things for the positionality of the inmates in, in prisons is how long have they been sitting there. And something similar develops uh, in Theresienstadt. In fact, um, towards the end of the book, I tell the story of Rolf Grabo, who is one of my favorite protagonists and also someone who makes should make us uneasy, but is really one of the most fascinating figures when you think about Holocaust in Central Europe. Grabo is a three-quarter Jew. He's a Protestant, he's a very believing Christian, and he's persecuted because he's racially Jewish, according to the Newmark laws. Before his dismissal from uh, his job in 1935, he worked for the Ministry of Finance in Germany. Um, he was actually one of the most high-ranking Jewish um, clerks, uh, Beamten, and he was one of the uh, grounding fathers of the Umsatzsteuer uh, in, in Germany. And um, you can also read about him in Schwerin von Krosik's um, slightly fake and Nazi uh, memoir. And Grabo was deported to Theresienstadt in 42. And he, in the beginning, he had it pretty tough because he tried to come with his CV to be recognized as a really useful part of the Jewish self-administration. And it did not really go well with Jacob Edelstein because Edelstein was a flaming Zionist. So he did not expect a Prussian, not even middle-aged, but older guy, who was baptized, who was Christian, and for whom Jewishness was at best something really, really abstract. 
who kept coming in and saying, I have here some updates about how to make our bureaucracy better because I am a Beamta from a Prussian ministry. Listen to me, I know how to do it better. Now, this would not go well anywhere, and it particularly went really poorly for Grabo. But that's the point about social capital and stamina that I was trying to make uh, before. He never gives up. And we have here is not diary, but something like Tagesvermarke that he kept throughout, where he writes about all the people who he meets, and he never gave up. He stopped uh, when Edelstein was deported to Auschwitz. He um, went to the next Jewish leadership, and eventually he was able to make his way so that at the end he became one of the controlling judges. Um, and I think there is a PhD in uh, the law faculty that is just being written somewhere at the Humboldt University. So I find people like Rabo particularly useful ways how to think about the many worlds of Theresienstadt, how you have here what you would call in German a Sperigemann, this difficult person, but also who was connected to so many other people in Theresienstadt, to Arnold Munter, a half Jewish communist who was deported to Theresienstadt mostly because of his political resistance, to Anna Auredničková, an important Czech poet whose husband um, uh, defended uh, Hilsna in an um, important Czech anti Semitic trial, um, and many other stories. And when you follow up the threads and connections between people, it also helps you get Grabo out of this corner of a kind of weird Prussian gentleman who is curious but not really interesting into a passport total of the interconnectedness of Theresienstadt walls. And at the end of the story, and now I kind of got lost myself, but now I found my story again. A couple of weeks before liberation, uh, he went to the hairdresser uh, because his hair was overgrown, just like probably all of us now in uh, lockdown. And um, the uh, hairdresser, even though he was empty, is like, um, how long have you been here? And Grabo is trying his tricks on him and say something like six months. And then Grabo, the hairdresser is like, go away. I only cut hair to people who really deserve to be here. And then Grabo is like, actually, I was here 36 months. And the hairdresser is like, oh, you came just three months after me. We are here almost as long as the ghetto is. And so he cuts his hair. And it's the moment when rather than being German and therefore a foreigner who does not belong, the coinage is his seniority in the ghetto. And at the end, you see how, Tere, how Grabova made his piece in Theresienstadt. It is able to talk the talk and walk the walk, if you want. Can, can you say, before we move to the next topic, a little bit about the tensions and the, also the demography of the, between the Germans and the, or the German or, and the, the Altreich? And the and 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 the Czech uh, and and the Czech Jews. I mean, we all, many of us, have in mind Leo Beck, and it's over dominated by German, but it's not actually like that. So, can you tell us what what how was the population, uh, the demography of the population, and the tensions between the two major groups? Yeah. Um... Well, maybe I will start a little bit on Leo Beck and then talk about the foreigners and the locals. So there are many stories about Leo Beck and I looked into it quite a bit uh, because I found it fairly quickly that the stories about Leo Beck are largely Elm legend and hagiography. And I offer my reading of um, a close reading of sources of what we can find out about Leo Beck. I found out that he was a very skilled functionary, somebody who was a very skilled politically uh, uh, to kind of operate in the muddy waters of Jewish functionaries. He was also somebody who could be very quick in cutting people loose if he felt that it was politically uh, quicker. And if you want to know more, read the first chapter uh, of the book. Um, I think I have there six or seven pages uh, on back. I don't want to give away too much because um, I guess it will be uh, surprising and new to uh, many of the audience today. Um, what was so interesting about Theresienstadt in my thinking is its profound transnational character. After all, it was not only almost all Czech Jews who were deported here, but also people from Altreich, people from Austria, from the Netherlands, Denmark, Slovakia, Hungary, and at the very end of the war, also lots of people from occupied Eastern Europe, including uh, Gentiles. And on one hand, Theresienstadt developed a common identity, a common mass narrative, or what does it 
mean to be there. This was not necessarily Jewish. It was something about what is the meaning and what is the sense of being in Theresien Chat. And it was, I guess, a kind of classic continuation of the century European um, assimilation uh, Jewish narrative about decency that people like Marin Kaplan or Markus Pekka have uh, so movingly interpreted. So you still have kind of this talking about here, uh, we used to be lawyers and we never did any manual labor and now we are in Theresien Chat that look, we can do so well and we can take care of our youngest and we can do such a beautiful cultural presence. And from that, you already see that much of this uh, mass narrative of Theresienstadt is something that to this date continues to color our understanding of what Theresienstadt became. So yes, you have a certain commonality here, but on the other hand, there was a strong differentiation between the Czech Jews as the locals and everybody who came from abroad, abroad being from outside from the protectorate. Some exceptions were made for Czech refugees who were caught up, say, in the Netherlands or Denmark and sent to Theresienstadt, but the differentiation is not alongside language, because many of the Jews from the protectorate spoke German as their native language, but from the place where they were deported from, and also uh, from their accent. So if you speak German with Prague or Brunner accent, you are recognized or categorized as a Czech Jew and hence a local. And if you speak German with a Berlin or Hamburg accent, you are a foreigner. And uh, what I saw over and over that largely the Czech Jews did not differentiate so much between the Germans and the Viennese and the Dutch and whatnot, but there was a binary thinking between the locals and the foreigners and the Czech Jews are such a dominant group that this binary vision between the locals and the foreigners is eventually something that is um, influential for pretty much everyone. Wow. Okay, now let's move to gender. Um, you also take the category of gender very, very seriously and really unapologetically at all. So how did gender uh, and then, I, of course, I say it in the most positive way, in the sense that, like every any other history that could be viewed from a gender perspective, and it's always enriching us and producing new knowledge. So you do uh, uh, in on Therese and such. So how actually gender played out in, in in the ghetto? Yeah, well, I guess the main reason why I have become a serious gender historian is because I was trained by Doris Bagan, and Doris Bagan has always really established women's history in the Holocaust as a very serious field and as a field that is analytical. So um, I really have to say, I really learned so much uh, from my uh, Dr. Mutta. Um, and one of the things that I tried to do in the book is to show how gender is a defining category in so much in how uh, the everyday in the ghetto, in the power and in the categories are uh, being negotiated. Allow me to share two examples. One is, um, the Jewish functionaries and people in position of power. When people wanted to criticize the Jewish functionaries for what they called collaboration, and it's one of the concepts that I try to show we should be critical of because it's such a charged and politicized term, they used sexualization to mark them as deviant and as wrong. So for example, they described Jakob Edelstein as somebody who is close to the people and whose masculinity is kind of the uh, Jewish masculinity, the correct masculinity. And they described uh, Benjamin Mollmerstein, the last elder of the Jews, who was seen uh, fairly negatively as somebody who is not only problematic because he's too close to the Germans, but also who is depicted as negative because of his presumed sexual deviance. Uh, somebody who presumably forced women into uh, sexual barter and whatnot. And I looked into it. This is a narrative. It is uh, not possible to be, uh, this, this, this is a construction, but to accuse somebody of untoward sexual uh, behavior is a powerful means to discredit them. Um, and this is an example to show how powerful uh, gender is. On the other hand, um, I show the depictions and constructions of Czechness. Um, and how it is something that comes to be uh, analyzed and understood as meaningful and as beautiful. And this is the moment when I will plug in the website that I uh, built or had built for my book, which is thelastghetto.org. And plus, if you are listening, maybe you can put it into the uh, chat. The website is useful because it includes the uh, maps that uh, my partner has drawn for the book. 
um, in high resolution and also the illustrations from the book uh, in high resolution and in color. OUP would not put them in color. So it's something that you may want to check out, especially for the following. So one of the drawings that I analyze in the book in great detail is a charming watercolor that lies in the Leobeck Institute by Lotka Boreshova for her friend, the frame maker, uh, Franz Feigl. And it's a girl jumping through the frame um, um, that is kind of dressed in a very simplified Czech national costume, wearing colors in Czech national colors in uh, blue, uh, white and red. But also she is not dressed much. She has exposed legs and cleavage and upper arms. And some of the points that I make is uh, she's beautiful to the Czech beholder because she's half naked. To the foreign uh, beholder, she also is pretty and cute, but mostly she's half naked. And here you see, in order to express the beautiful Czechness, the artist chose a women's figure. Okay, I'm so. Um, now I maybe I will write, while you ask, I will write it into the chat so that people see. Okay, well, uh, so uh, you, you also mentioned it now, and uh, throughout the book you talk. I'm okay. Throughout the book, you talk about what you call the master narrative of the of the ghetto, uh, and that the prisoners developed all in order to explain to them, as you said, to explain to themselves the extreme and the, uh, disorienting uh, reality in which they were thrown. Now, in in, in many places, uh, you seem to be critical of this uh, of this. I don't know if morally, crit ethically critical or. Empirically, empirically critical uh, of this Theresienstadt mass narrative, um, which you also sometimes call it redemptive at, at certain point. Um, so can you explain that? Can you, and, and I think it ties up to the, the first question of what do you do new in this? Uh, so what, what, what is this master narrative? How did it develop? Who were its uh, agents? Who developed it who, uh, uh, during the war and perhaps after the war? And what, why do you call it redemptive and what's your take on it? Well, what, what, how do you understand it and how do you try to say, to tell the story uh, a little bit different? Yeah, well, Amos and Alon, you are my hosts and you are one of the foremost Israeli historians who have looked at the Zionist narrative of the Shoah and have really crumbled it into pieces. So you are not the right person to ask me what is a mass narrative and why we need to deconstruct it. Mass narratives here are to serve legitimization and the purpose. And it's the job of the historian to find out that these are mass narratives, to locate how these narratives work and to show how they came about. Um, you kind of come to see the mass narrative because you read the testimonies by people in Theresienstadt and you see this kind of meaning of Theresienstadt come over and over and over again. It comes up already in Theresienstadt. It comes out in the key works published in Theresienstadt, be it the Iltis uh, book from 1968 that many of you will have at home or uh, at uh, Ruth Bondi, or if you look at the famous uh, book of children's drawings, um, I have never seen another butterfly. This kind of, uh, I guess, this person who writes, keeps writing to the chat, keeps bubbling up and it's a little bit um, uh, uh, um, um, confusing. So maybe people could not use the chat and just write into Q&A because it kind of blows up all over my uh, screen and I need to focus on Amos's questions. So the master narrative is something that kind of serves to all of the people in Theresienstadt to be, uh, to feel uh, members of the community and to endow the experience uh, with sense. Um, it also serves, I guess, uh, to glaze over to some of the things that are happening in Theresienstadt, in which uh, the uh, prisoner community and the Jewish self-administration are engaging, uh, be it deliberately or undeliberately, to make ends meet and to glaze them over the story because they are not feel-good stories. The mass narrative serves to make the prisoners of Theresienstadt and everybody afterwards that something good came out, out of something bad. But this is not how history works. History does not have a sense and does not have a meaning. And definitely nothing good came out of the Holocaust because it's a genocide. And I guess I felt it was my job to show that this is a mass narrative and it's nothing more and nothing less 
than to do that. I guess when some of the people whose parents and grandparents uh, were imprisoned in Theresienstadt and told them these stories, they read my book and I have heard it from a couple of people, they start to understand that many of the stories they heard, it suddenly makes sense because they see how they were made and to what end it served. But I do not want to judge with the book. I want to help to understand how people live and die. Um, okay, so now let's go into one of the most sensitive issues uh, about Theresienstadt. Let's talk about the Jewish leadership uh, in the ghetto and particularly about uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Mermelstein, who was depicted uh, in Lanzmann's film, The Last of the Unjust, as someone who should be located deep in the gray zone. What do you think of him? What do you think of the leadership as a whole and particularly about uh, Mermelstein? My sense, and you said it's not the right sense, but I still say, the, my, my sense was that um, you, you, uh, uh, you, you do not shy away of criticizing this society, but somehow you are more under, empathic, I would say, to the, to the leadership, uh, or perhaps not, perhaps I'm wrong about that, but um, so what is your take on really on, on this leadership, which was, we all understand between uh, in, in, an impossible, uh, in an impossible position, uh, nonetheless was very much critical, criticized during and after. And mm -hmm. particularly, as I say about Mermelstein. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, I, I guess I'm fascinated by Mermelstein because he's such a great figure. And if you think that I'm soft on him, it, it is because I find him so interesting. It's also easy to find him interesting because he survived. And therefore he gave us so many sources Oh boy, Benjamin, the man who never stopped talking and he never stopped writing. I mean, you have seen The Last of the Unjust. I said in 2007 when they released it in USHMM for a week or two and watched the many, many hours of the filming material that uh, Lanzmann has uh, taken with Mormonstein back in the 1970s. And um, in fact, um, I should say um, I came in my thinking about the Jewish leadership uh, deeply influenced by the work of my friend Beate Maya, who has written about the Reich Association of German Jews. Beate was writing her book a little bit before I was writing my PhD, so we overlapped and we exchanged about it a lot. And this thinking about Jewish functionaries um, is really influenced by Dan Dina and this kind of thinking we should I really beseech Sylvia Stein to write her questions to Q&A and not into the chat. I will do it one more time, the last time. Um, and to the Jewish functionaries, not to necessarily judge them whether they did good or bad because it has been done so many times and a little bit this discussion has run its course, but to kind of move into understanding their leeway, coming to understand the mechanisms why they were hated so much and why they were judged so much and also why did they did this work? I mean, you said it, Amos, this was an impossible position. I spent quite some time in the book on unpacking how the great and the small commission uh, for transport, for picking up the names for the transport actually worked. And it may be very nerdy and maybe actually I'm a very nerdy person, but it's an impossible job to do well. There is no happy way to put together a transport of people to Auschwitz. And yet they decide to do it because they believe they can do it in a human way. And I guess almost the one concession to my applied use would be, I know what happens in the fall 44 and I know how much people suffered knowing they are going to the east to the unknown that they fear with a good right that it was going to be deadly and they go there apart from their um, spouses and all, apart from their children and it's heartbreaking and it gives them a measure of comfort to go with their family. I have gone through the surviving collection of the petitions to be taken off transport and among people who are trying to escape the transport are people who are fighting to be put on transport to be with their uh, lovers or to be with their uh, children because the mothers who are exempt and whose whole family is being sent, this is equally or horrible in a different way. So it was the Jewish function, um, Jewish uh, self 
administration that decided that as long as they are in charge, they will uh, respect unity of families and they will send nuclear families uh, together. And this is something that is in practice until October 44, when it's the SS that starts putting together the transport lists. Um, and those are some of the questions that I hope to illuminate in the book. I'm sure you have some more questions, but it's my first step at an answer. We are, we are really running short of time and there's a flood of Q&A, but I, there's one more question I have to ask. I mean, I'll drop the half of my questions, but, yes, there's, one, but there's one I want to ask. We have a very fascinating chapter about the food in the ghetto. So, uh, so beside the fact that food as an object of research is also, mm. I mean, everybody talks about food and starvation, but you made it a whole chapter about food, the social, the social, social impact of food, it's a cultural, uh, but you also reach, you actually portray a society that did not want to distribute the food, did not want, you all, I mean, or was not willing or to, to put effort in distributing the food resources in an egalitarian way, and almost, I, I dare say, deliberately decided to starve the elderly population, some of them to death, I mean, a large percentage of them. So can you elaborate about this a little bit? Mm -hmm. I can. Um, I should say that the chapter on food does not only discuss the starvation of the elderly and the misdistribution of food, it also looks at uh, food as a kind of cultural history of how taste and family and gender changes. So for example, with whom you decide to eat food and what food is now suddenly considered posh. And the funny story, how the later leading country in the Altneuschule is given um, pork cracklings um, as a gift uh, and nobody bets an eyelash. I think those are also important bits. So I do not want to have the food chapter uh, reduced just to misdistribution, even though you are completely correct. I guess it's um, an important, um, maybe the important uh, point uh, that I make there. I specifically put the point on distribution of food into the context on research on famine by people like Amatya Sen, who have theorized that as soon as it comes to uh, situations uh, of uh, shortages, however small the shortages, it will lead to misdistribution of food and it will lead to much bigger effects on the misdistribution and possibly famine than would be, I guess, economically or mathematically necessary. I mean, here in England, and of course England is not the pinnacle of great leadership to say it lightly, and I say it as a British citizen, uh, last fall, spring when the pandemic happened, many supermarkets, pretty much all supermarkets in London, saw shortages of food. I did not see any flower between March to the end of May, and I would go to Waitrose and take photographs of the empty shelves uh, and send it to my relatives and friends outside of Great Britain who did not believe me. I mean, as you see, we have survived. It was fine. People can live without eggs and flour and uh, canned beans. But this is a banal story how mistribution works in a system that is knudged just a little bit. In Theresienstadt, just as in many other societies that are hit by misdistribution, it has grave impact. And it has many, many steps. It has the steps that the self-administration decided in May 42, when they already know that the Jews from Germany and Austria are going to arrive, and they know that these people will be elderly, that there will be I guess triage and categorization of food between hard laborers, normal laborers, um, and uh, non workers. And the non workers are the elderly. And the non workers not only get the least of food, they get also the least heterogeneous food that is uh, least healthy and has almost no vitamins. So not only do the old people die of starvation, they also die of lack of vitamins and their uh, bodies just do not have the immunity to uh, withhold um, enteritis of which almost everybody is sick in Theresienstadt. But it's the main cause uh, for almost all of the 34,000 people who die in Theresienstadt, the absolute uh, majority of whom are people above 60 years of uh, age. And then you have many other aspects such as uh, the cooks and the butchers and the bakers who are there for also their friends and their families and they support them because it's the thinking in the networks. They want to be good friends and it's human and it's natural. And I guess 
many of us would not behave differently. And when you think about uh, playing soccer in Theresienstadt, it means that all these beautiful young men who run around for 70 minutes at the soccer field, they need to be fed. And they are fed by their friends who are cooks often from the non-war Croatians, because as I show, it was the easiest to remove food from the non-war Croatians, which makes the non-war Croatians even smaller. Then you have people like the uh, butcher Bohomil Benda, who stole food and sold it to the outside. And this is a really crucial bit. He did not sell food from within Theresienstadt, where it would be much more expensive, but it would be much harder to get the money outside. He sold the food outside of Theresienstadt, where it's obviously the purchasing power is much lower. You know, if you sell to someone a kilo of beef in Theresienstadt, you will get from it a couple, I don't know, 20 packs of cigarettes or more. If you sell it outside, it will be one pack of cigarettes. I mean, these are just examples. I'm not thinking through these examples in purchasing power. I would have to go through my sources to give you uh, the purchasing power. And it's something much, much more expensive. Why is Benda so dead bent on sending money outside? He has a gentle girlfriend in Prague and he's trying to send her money. Eventually he was um, captured. It came to the fore. He was sent to the commando in Vulkov. He made blood, blood here too. And in fall 44, he was sent to Dachau and perished like many Czech Jews in Kaufering. This is not to say that Benda was a bad person and that he deserved to die because nobody deserved to die. Even the Jewish informers who volunteered to report for the SS did not deserve to die. This is a story how society behaves during shortages and misdistribution and it's the task of us to take notice of it and to think about what it means. All that I want us to do is to have the whole history and to accept it. This Bohumil Benda and the old lady from Vienna who dies of starvation and enteritis. Okay, uh, Alon will join us now for the, I mean, I have many more questions, but the also <laughs> our audience have a lot of questions. So let's begin with the, Alon. Yeah, you Thank you, question. Anna and Amos for this fascinating discussion. When I hear you, Anna, just an observation, when I hear you, when I read the book, um, I think that in your scholarship, you refuse to accept comfortable answers. And you always, you always look into the human motivation, not with suspicion, but with a recognition that contradictions abound and that different, um, different feelings, different motivations, different identities can coexist in different contexts. And, and it, lead, it leads you, this, this, this uh, way of thinking, this questioning of the sources leads you to um, insightful um, findings. That's, that's my sense. So we have a question about the sources. Which sources did you use? Did you use old sources and ask them uh, new questions or did you use new sources or both? But how, how did the sources made the work for you in writing a new, a new, a new account of the Resenstadt? Yeah. Thank you, Alan, for such a profound remark. I guess this is exactly what I tried to do, not to settle down with comfortable answers. I always felt there is this proverb, how history is like the ocean from afar, it's majestic. And when you are in the middle of it, you just want to throw up. Um, uh, the sources I used, I looked at all. I felt when you look at Bondi and when you look at Laogos and uh, Polak and when you look at Adler and when you look at um, all these various works, they work with a fraction of sources, which also was due to the time and place in which they wrote their books. And thanks to very generous funding from various funding bodies, I was able to spend two years traveling around the world. In the very beginning of the PhD, I sat down with a friend who is actually a famous historian of perpetrators, Andre Angerik, and kind of hatched the plan of what is it that I'm trying to do here. And I made, um, systematic list of all archives where there are relevant materials about Theresienstadt. I mean, this list grew over time, but there is no 
central archive for materials for today's institute. So I went to the Wien Library here in London. I went to Yad Vashem and to Givat Chaim Echut to Beit Terezin. I went to the Jewish Museum Prague, to the National Archive, to the Terezin Memorial. Um, I went to the uh, Landesarchiv Berlin to look at the Opferdes Fascismus files. Um, I was at the USHMM um, and I was at a number of other archives. And I looked at materials in four languages that I speak fluently, Czech, German, Dutch, and English. And um, I looked at all histories, I looked at diaries, um, I looked at the um, uh, post-war trials, which were also important for the understanding of the interactions between the Germans, um, of the SS, because many of them are actually Austrian, uh, and of the Jews. I looked at the people who did not understand themselves as Jewish, I looked at the testimonies of the Protestant and Catholic community in Theresienstadt, and I looked at the rabbis, at the reform and at the orthodox. I looked at the people who participated in the communist resistance and I looked at the people who claimed after the war that they participated in resistance and I simply read through it all and what I wanted to do and I'm a big believer in the inductive method so I just kind of first read it through all of it and took notes and somewhere in the middle I sat down and it was okay now I will look through this mass and look for the patterns and the topics that repeat and that gave birth to the six chapters that the book is structured in. Organization, ethnicity, food and hunger, medicine, um, culture, and transports to the East. And then with each of them, I then sat down, sourced out the testimonies, looked at my notes, and decided, based on my notes, what is the narrative of each of the chapters? Thank you, Anna. There is a question is from, from someone who read the book and is admirer of the book. And he asks, you wrote in your book that we cannot affirm that there was a spiritual or cultural resistance in Theresienstadt. So can we instead say that in some cases there was a resilience, if not resistance? Or, or, or how would you how would you approach this issue of resistance, spiritual, cultural, or other? Um, I can add also the concept of choiceless choice that you criticize in your book. Yes, yeah. we have also a question about this. Let's, let's just add it. The, the leadership talked about choiceless choice, especially after the war, whether it was a narrative of the leadership in order to explain to itself and to the world its deeds, while actually there were choices, these choices were not choiceless. Let me just add that we are going to end our conversation at 1.15. I'm sure that there will be many more questions. Uh, and after 1.15, that's the time to start reading the book. Let, let me add that we mean 9.15 in Israel. And 715. <laughs> so um, I will try to answer quickly so that there is time for more questions. To my admirer, I hope you are not mad with me when I will gently say that I find resilience a potentially another redemptive term. And we should stop expecting Holocaust victims to be nice, great, because they try to survive. We all try to survive. That's normal. That's human. That's not something that we should praise. Because when we start looking in the Holocaust for something that we are going to, um, you know, uh, be all like clapping our hands over this is this is I guess problematic because it's a bit judgy. Because then what like are we going to say the evil evil people who did not survive? And, and please do not take it badly because it's great that somebody read my book. It's very exciting for me to hear. Alon and Amos, choiceless choices. Um, when Lawrence Langer um, wrote about this concept, he applied it to the annihilation camps and to the um, Zondo Commando and to these very minimal choices in which people are kind of forced to do. And if they choose, somebody dies, sure enough, dignity goes to court, I believe. And then it kind of became a runaway automaton in which people see everything that happens in the Holocaust as choiceless choices that are not real because they are not dignified. And I guess I arrived at it because as you pointed out, Alon, I kind of get away from the comfortable truth and I just like 
over the last seven years in my job, there are so many moments, in fact, all of the moments that are shorn of dignity. There is no dignity in academic jobs. Obviously, it's much better than being in a concentration camp. But that goes to the earlier point of Amos about the difference between concentration camp society and the normal society, we have so little leeway and I can decide so very little and we go to so many meetings and I have to make all of my students happy and can I actually really instant any pedagogical values? I am not always certain. So my point about uh, choiceless choices criticism is I think it's high time if we uh, want to understand what was going on in the minds of Holocaust victims is to take and recognize their choices seriously. That can mean keeping a diary, that can mean deciding to go with your mother on transport or not going with your mother on transport, deciding to steal your neighbor's carrot or not to steal that carrot. And I guess judging from our relatively cashy situation, we will neglect the carrot and the transport because it's everything is horrible and everything is the Holocaust. But this is the job of the Altax historian to kind of go there and to understand how important that is. And really influential for me here was the work of my friend uh, Alexander Garbarini, who really got into the minds of those Holocaust diarists to recognize these small gestures that they did. And then uh, somewhat later, Eliana Adler, in her beautiful article about Hrubyshov, said these bits about decision to go or to stay. Today, we think they all died. Does it matter? Yes, it matters. And if you want to understand what went on, we need to take these choices seriously. And comrades, this is the hill I will die on. I'm also yeah, muted. Yeah, not anymore. Um, so uh, th this is a question from Lisa Heinemann. Uh, in the context of the Czech-German hierarchy or chronology, I'm interested to know about those stories that some Germans came expecting a spa. What's the evidence for this? Do you know this from German inmate testimonies? If from Czech inmate sources, to what extent should we consider it hyperbole or a way of ridiculing the foreigners? And then she, I think it's still the same question. Um, okay, so that's enough for for now. Yeah. Okay, Lisa, thank you. Okay, I speak here from memory, um, and but I believe that you have some testimonies of people from Germany who go there expecting a spy. You definitely have a fair bit of discourse about Czechs as the place of um, spa countries. Um, there is also this documentary movie about an old lady from Vienna who survived the deportation to Theresienstadt. And I think somebody recorded with her after the war an early um, like, um, uh, disc testimony. And it's called Theresienstadt sieht aus wie ein Co-Ort. co, -ort. co -ort ist I'm sure Lisa, you know all this and I'm already mansplaining. I would not say this 100% that the spa metaphor definitely comes from Germans, but I have a strong feeling I saw it. That's what I will say. Anna, someone asked you a question about race. Indeed, we talked, we talked about gender as a category, about class. About class, we, we may return to it because a few people asked. What about the category of race? Mm -hmm. as a key category in the camp. Yeah, it, it is, I would maybe not call it race, but ethnicity, because of course, everybody who was sent here was because they were nominally Jewish, whether they understood themselves as Jewish or not, is a different question. And actually it really shows, and this is a conclusion that many people draw in Theresienstadt themselves, that there is no common Jewishness and that there is in that engendered ethnic differences. It does not make people overnight, you know, have different eye color or big nose or small nose or whatnot, but it shows how people start obsessing over uh, looks and over skin tone and over cultural gestures and over um, gender differences that they make sense of in ethnicized terms. And they start seeing ethnicity 
but I guess there is none. And I take it as a point that we need to always see class in ethnicized terms, but also to see ethnicity in class terms because it's very closely linked. I mean, many um, ethnologists have pointed out that ethnicity obviously is a social construction, but no one has looked at the Holocaust in such terms. And um, that's something where I would actually welcome uh, people to look at in future studies of concentration camps and ghettos, to look at racism and ethnic differences and the constructions uh, thereof, um, because it's really something that helps us understand the working of the camp society and also to look at the bound at, at solidarity and uh, the famous solidarity of political prisoners, but also boundaries thereof. And that goes also back to the question of social capital. How come some people are able to surpass certain racist uh, boundaries that are kept against them because they're German, and they think like Germans, and they're frustrating because they're German, and eventually they become accepted because they're Matilde, the neighbor, and not Matilde, the frustrating German. And those are the really interesting stories. Why do you say ethnicity and not race, Anna? Um, I'm, I'm asking because in, in Holocaust historiography, race is a, is a very common term. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, I say race because everybody is nominally Jewish. Uh, and um, because if I start differentiating between German race and Czech race, it will get us into a very thin uh, territory. Um, I was deeply influenced by Frederick Bart and his work on ethnicity as a constructed category. And then by, you know, these classical Bruberger and Cooper um, kind of looking at what is happening in uh, Cluj and elsewhere. Um, and it's ethnicity they write about. Um, there are probably some profound debates about that in anthropology that I did not look at. Someone is asking about, yeah, someone is asking about uh, the reasons for survival. And you said it was not, or uh, did you say that it was not coincident who survived mm -hmm. and who not? Or what were the reasons for one to survive if there were reasons and one for uh, increasing the chances of survival in, 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 uh, in, in, in Theresienstadt? So you can say, can you talk a little bit about the intersection between survival, class, or other aspects? Okay, I just looked and saw that the smart question about race came from Alice and Alice Weinrepp and I have been actually debating exactly that. So I'm sorry, Alice, that this was relatively simplistic. Um, survival was um, um, nexus of several categories and contingency and accident are incredibly important of that. You can be a very well networked Czech Jew who has good connections to somebody from the Auba Commando from the construction detail. And if you arrive at the wrong point, then there are many, many transports to Lublin district that will not help you unless you are a particularly strong connection to say um, Jakob Edelstein or Gondar Edlich. And then Maybe later, if you arrive at the correct point, you are able to play out with your networks, with your social capital, um, uh, with the fact that you are Czech, um, and kind of uh, segue it into a relatively good position in Theresienstadt. And some people, um, even though they are sent on the very best transport in September 43 to Auschwitz, because they are nurses, because they are attractive, like the Nagotlibova, or because they are physicians, um, uh, like Viktor um, uh, Victor Kosak, they are even able to survive the selection or, or the, the, the murder of the September transport on actually just yesterday was the anniversary on 8th March 1944, when the first half of the family transport uh, is murdered. So contingency is immensely important of that. But if you want to look at the main factors, it is seniority, networks, age, gender, social capital, and your class in the ghetto. So uh, I, I, perhaps we have uh, uh, time for one or two more questions. Uh, I will read the uh, Henry Grinspan um, 
uh, it is my you you partially answered it, but nonetheless, I think it has a value to. It is my impression that issues of class has been one of the relatively forgotten in Holocaust studies, as gender earlier was. Do you agree? So you said, I don't know what your general take on it. If so, how do you understand uh, why? Is there a difference? And now I think this is also a very general question, and I think very interesting to think about this question vis-a-vis, -vis, not only vis-a-vis -vis the issue of class, is there a difference in early survivor accounts, testimonies, uh, project relative to later in this regard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you so much. This is a brilliant question. Um, and it kind of goes to the heart also of the food chapter and why this is, um, I guess, dicey if you so want, or to what Alon said about these uncomfortable histories that we ought to write. Um, writing about class shows social differences between victims who the post-war narrative came to um, treat um, as hagiography. Um, and these people, most of them died, died under most undignified and horrible conditions, were not saints. They were people, they were people like us living in history. And if you want to understand what they went through, thinking about class and social hierarchies in the camps and ghettos is, in my opinion, one of the best ways to conceptualize thinking about agency and how people react to persecution and how they try to make it for them more livable. That would be my response again to the resilience question. Um, largely the social expectations, what ought to be recalled about Theresienstadt, the collective memory of what was the Holocaust and how was Theresienstadt like came to influence people's memories, be it in their memoirs, and they publish autobiographies and all histories, but it did not have the same influence on everyone. I remember uh, this uh, woman who belonged to the social social elite in Theresienstadt, who in Theresienstadt became pregnant and was able to carry to term. And she said to her interviewer something like, I was never hungry in Theresienstadt. And she was like, oh, can you actually remove it? Because this is not a suitable memory. Um, and when you look at some of the early testimonies, you have Vera Nalosova, who called one of her friends uh, a Bramborový Krao, the potato king. And these are things that start being a bit thinner. But I thought what was an advantage of my system of basically going like a carpet bomber through the archives, when you have these many, many different voices from the Germans and from the Czechs, from the older and from the younger, written in the 1990s and written um, in, uh, in the, in, as diaries. Um, you get all of the voices and you can cross-check them. Anna, in the three minutes that we are left, can you tell us something about the liberation of the camp? Yeah, this is the title giving title um, of the book. Um, many Israelis believed that Lodz was the last ghetto, Lodz was not the last ghetto, the last ghetto to be liberated, and that stood until the liberation with some 15,000 of the veteran prisoners was Theresienstadt. That was actually liberated one day after the capitulation of the German army on the 9th of uh, May 1945. It was liberated by the first Ukrainian front, and some two, three weeks before the liberation, the Germans started sending uh, death marches from all across Germany, especially from Bergen Belsen, and elsewhere uh, to be sent here. It's not quite clear what they actually planned to do with the people from the evacuation transports, whether they planned to kill them here or whether they had similar plans to Mauthausen, where historians have shown that actually there were plans for gas chambers uh, in Mauthausen. But um, in the last days of Theresienstadt, the International Red Cross was able to negotiate taking over Theresienstadt under uh, their jurisdiction so that the prisoners knew since the early May days that actually they are going to make it alive. In fact, some of the prisoners who were Czech, um, especially people with uh, gentile relatives, escaped and went on their own to Prague or where else. So the gentile relatives came and uh, picked them up. But also what happened is that the people from the desmarches were often infected with a lot of diseases, including and now I'm blanking out whether it's typhoid or typhus, forgive me, it's, I'm a bit tired, I taught three hours today, and infected a lot of people, and so that some of the veteran prisoners actually died, and while the Red Army medical personnel that came after Knights of May treated them excellently, 
the um, Czech medical personnel that came to take care of the small fortress, the nearby Gestapo prison actually treated the Jews as kind of second class um, uh, patients. I debated writing also about the last phase of Theresienstra, the kind of phase out in summer 45 and about what happened with the small fortress, but then I thought shorter is better. Okay, I think we reached the end of our discussion, which was extremely fascinating and illuminating and thought-provoking. I think we all uh, have a lot to think about. Those we could not, I mean, there were really a lot of questions. We will copy them and send them to Anna and if you will be able to um, answer them or anywhere, anywhere else, but you will see the question. And uh, so thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Anna, for the talk and for the fascinating book. Thank you, Alon, for this uh, encounter. And as Alon said at the beginning, we expect to see you on April. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Bye. Bye.